Hi, this is Todd from the stringclub.com. Uh, one of the string club members recently asked me about um, how you can play in tune either without tapes or without looking, having to look at your fingers and, and follow. Uh, if you have fingerboard tapes, that's a great way to start learning, but ultimately we have to be able to play without them. We need our eyes for other things, for reading the sheet music or watching a conductor, or if you're playing in a chamber group, you need to have visual communication with the other people in that group. And so it's something that eventually we have to sort of outgrow, the need to look at the tapes to match to be able to play in tune. Uh, so I decided to make a video, actually it'll probably be a two, maybe three part video depending on how quickly I can get through these, uh, these concepts. But there's a lot of things to consider when you are trying to play your instrument in tune. Um, that's one of the hardest things, one of the most frustrating things about playing orchestral string instruments, violin, viola, cello, and double bass. They all have the same issue. We always have to constantly work on refining our intonation. There's always a risk that we'll play out of tune, um, unlike with uh, fretted instruments and pianos and so forth. Um, even the great professional uh, top violinists and everything uh, play out of tune once in a while, but they've trained themselves to correct the pitch very quickly, so it's hardly even noticeable when it happens. Um, <clears throat> so the thing I'd like to emphasize first is the importance of listening to music on a regular basis. Uh, if you listen to music regularly, you'll start to develop a better sense of pitch. You'll develop a sense of when a note is in tune, when it's out of tune. That's something that, I, that we can't really quantify easily. For instance, if I play an F sharp, and it doesn't sound in tune, I can't really explain to you, oh, that's 0.3 hertz flat or something like that, or, uh, or even in distances. For instance, uh, if I play this whole step, I happen to know that the distance from E to F sharp is about an inch and three eighths. Well, that doesn't really help me when I'm performing, though, because I don't have a ruler there. I don't have um, any sort of guide for that. I can't tell exactly where an inch and three eighths is. But if I have a good ear, if I've developed that through uh, years and years of listening to great music played well, then I can listen and adjust as I go. I'll have an automatic sort of sense of when it's in tune and when it's out of tune. And I know that's not a very satisfactory answer to a beginner who's trying, who's kind of struggling with this because uh, we want, you know, sort of quick, easy answers. Unfortunately, there's not a quick and easy answer for this, for developing a good sense of pitch. It comes easier for some people and uh, less so for others. So we need that constant input from our ears to make little adjustments as we go. Uh, when you play a fingered note, you will instantly, within the first millisecond, uh, recognize whether it's in tune or out of tune. Then, hopefully, very quickly thereafter, you'll recognize if it's sharp or flat, if it's out of tune. And then you can quickly make an adjustment. In some cases, all you have to do is sort of tilt the finger a little bit. Or if you're doing vibrato, you can wiggle in the direction you need to go a little bit more and that will, that will uh, get the pitch in tune. Uh, sometimes you may have to actually slide the finger forward if it's out of tune considerably. But the, all those things are dependent on you having a very good ear in the first place of knowing when it's in tune and when it's out of tune. That just comes from listening and listening carefully to yourself as you practice. Now playing in front of a tuner can be helpful. If you play scales and other music that you know well, slowly and carefully placing the fingers, watching the tuner, uh, that can help too, but it can be very frustrating because a lot of times a tuner, uh, even when you're trying to be very precise, the little needle that indicates where you are, it's going to wobble around a lot. So I always tell my students if they're playing with a tuner, don't get bogged down trying to get that needle exactly pinned to the perfect location. If you get it and it's kind of wobbling on either side, that's probably fine, move on, you've at least made some improvement on that. So using a tuner can be great, but don't let it bog you down, don't let it slow your practicing down until you are working on one pitch for minutes at a time, because you just won't accomplish very much. If you don't know what music to listen to, if you don't have favorite um, artists from your instrument to listen to, I'd suggest going to my cool videos uh, section on the website, and I'll provide a link in the description below. I've pulled a lot of really fun videos um, that are hopefully enjoyable to a lot of people, and you can start to uh, notice sort of which kinds of pieces you enjoy, which performers you enjoy. I'd encourage you to listen to, uh, if you're a violist, listen to the great viola players, and try to decide on two or three, maybe four, that you really enjoy and then just go to YouTube every day or so and just uh, listen to everything that's on uh, that's available by that performer and eventually you know purchase the music as well so you can listen to it on your uh, on the go and so forth um, having that as a habit and listening very carefully to the music will definitely help you with your pitch the next thing I'd like to discuss in terms of playing in tune is building muscle memory 
So I mentioned before the importance of feeling these distances. We can't really uh, think in terms of hertz. That, that's the measurement of pitch. We can't think in those terms and we can't think in terms of millimeters or inches. It, our, our physical body just doesn't work that way. Instead, it's just a constant repetition of a certain motion that trains the fingers where to play. So for instance, I'm playing this E to this F sharp right here and I just know that that distance is the correct distance. How do I know? Well, it's because I've played it probably you know tens of thousands of times in my in my uh, playing career so far, and that's just something that we need to do to build up that kind of feeling of security and, and, and confidence in that that pitch. That is why I always have my students do these repetitive kind of exercises I call finger pattern exercises. I'll provide links below in the description so that you can uh, play those with my website. I think it's really valuable to play these exercises that where you just repeat notes back and forth, back and forth a bunch of times and listen. The important thing is to listen to the computer play the pitch back to see if you match. If you're constantly getting this feedback of whether you're in tune or out of tune as you lift and drop the finger, then that will that's all those repetitions that we need to build that kind of um, sense of pitch and build that muscle memory. You'll probably notice that the, that the whole step will start off a little too small and you'll hear that your pitch doesn't match. And if you widen out that space just a little bit, then you'll hear it matching the pitch better. And as you move on, you'll notice most likely that your half steps are a little too wide and you'll pull them back in a little bit and then you'll realize that it matches the pitch better. So after thousands and thousands of repetitions of this, your fingers just start to hone in on the distances that they have to have. Again, it's not a quick and easy answer, but it's the right answer. We have to do these repetitions, listening, thinking, paying very close attention as we go. It's also incredibly important to do this on a regular basis. If you skip three or four days and do it again, you will have lost all of the muscle memory that you built those few days prior. If you do this on a Monday, and you don't do it again till Friday, you might as well not have done it on Monday. If you do it on Monday, you do it on Tuesday, then you build. Wednesday, you build. Thursday, you build. Now, it's okay, it's okay to take days off every once in a while, but you can't let several days go by. You have to be practicing on a regular basis. Again, just this constant reinforcement of this feeling of these distances is what we need to build. So basically what I'm getting at here is that it helps to know your tendencies. If you are playing uh, an E, for instance, and you notice that it's a little bit flat, just file that away in the memory banks, play, when you come back to that E again, if it's flat again, well you've probably just noticed that you have a tendency to play that out of tune, you have a tendency to play flat. That's very valuable because now we, it takes some of the mystery away of playing in tune. If you happen to know that your first finger on the D string tends to be flat, well now you can purposely play it a little higher than it feels like you should and you'll probably be more in tune. Uh, I think of it a lot like uh, when you're playing darts, for instance. If you're aiming perfectly for that bullseye, but the dart just usually ends up a little too low and, too left, and to the left, it's a very common thing. So obviously the solution then would be to aim a little higher and to the right than what you think it should be, and you'll probably hit the bullseye more often or get closer. Same thing here. I know that my tendencies play a little low. Well, I'm going to purposely aim a little bit high. I'll probably get better results right away. Uh, but you have to pay attention as you play and notice when those things keep coming up. Sometimes there is no tendency, maybe it's sharp sometimes, flat sometimes, and you can't really identify a tendency, but when there is, it's very valuable. It makes it much easier to fix that, uh, that tendency. Um, on violin and viola, the tendency is almost always to have whole steps a little too small, so you have to widen them out when there's a note in between, and for the half steps to be a little too big, you have to narrow them down. So widen out more than you think you need to for that, close that space off a little bit, and then widen out here, especially with the pinkies. Pinky doesn't like to stretch as much as the other fingers. <clears throat> if you notice that in your playing, you can fix it a lot better. Now for cello and bass, we have tendencies as well. Cello players, especially with the extended position when there's a whole step between one and two, usually that space isn't nearly big enough. We have to stretch out more than you think. And then three and four, those, whole, those half steps are usually okay, but we have to widen out right there. It's similar for bass. In our standard playing style, we have a half step between one and two, and then a half step between two and four don't use the third finger. So usually what happens is that half step there between one and two is too small and between two and four it's too big. Those should look basically equal. But you can tell they're not now. So for bass players we have to widen out this one and then squeeze these fingers together a lot more than we think we should.